Howdy, hey everyone. It is Phoenix, the voice behind Back to Ashes. I hope you are all doing well. If you are new here or you've been sitting in the shadows and you enjoy what you are hearing, please reach over and tickle that subscribe button and smash its brother the bell. Make sure to set that one to all, that way you don't miss every time I upload, which tends to be daily. Also, if you enjoy what you are hearing, you can buy me a coffee. Or if you're interested in becoming a member, all those links can be found right down below. With all of that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Scary Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. This happened about two years ago. I had just started my first year at junior college. My friend and I shared a night class and I frequently gave her a ride as she didn't live too far from me. We approached an intersection close to my college's parking lot, and I stopped at the stop sign, looking both ways. I saw a maroon truck in the far distance, like very, very far. It is important that I emphasize I had plenty of time to make my turn without putting any of us in danger. After making my turn, I checked my rearview mirror. I heard a noise, as if somebody had literally floored their gas pedal, and the truck was closing its distance behind me very quickly. My friend and I were a little peeved, but the entrance of the parking lot was closed, and we figured we'd lose him if we turned in to park. That was a big nope. He followed us into the lot. He even followed us as I circled around. I parked my car, and so did he, and he got out of his truck. He was pretty old, probably in his 60s or 70s. He yelled at me to get the fuck out of his car. I stayed put, telling my friend not to leave either. He shouted explicitives at us, telling me I cut him off and should be killed. He told me I shouldn't text and drive, but my phone was tucked away in my book bag. I'm glad I locked my car because this guy started banging on my windows and literally tried opening the damn doors. He got back in his truck and found the school security police that roamed the campus, honking them down and making them come into the parking lot. My friend and I since parked in a different spot away from him, but we didn't feel safe enough leaving our car. He sped off after speaking with the police officer. We finally got out of the car when he approached us. We explained our side. He told us he could see why we were shaken. According to the officer, he was screaming like an unhinged maniac. He told us to just be careful when driving and let us go on about our way. I stand by the fact that my turn was safe. But even if it hadn't have been, displaying that amount of road rage was completely and unnecessary, terrifying, and uncalled for. This story takes place in Northeast Oklahoma, I believe around 2009-2010. I was around 14 years of age at the time, so back then my aunt and I did everything together. She was my best friend, my rock, my everything, really. Our favorite thing to do in our boring and rural town was to just go driving around. I believe I had just finished school for the summer. It was May, and she offered to take me on a celebratory drive around town. In my old town, there's an old mental hospital that has been closed since the 1990s. It's located in a more of a rural-ish area. 
I've always been fascinated by it, and she was too. She even worked there as a teenager. There's a prison located extremely close to it, with guards and white trucks frequently driving the roads and preventing people from trying to sneak into the abandoned mental hospital. We both decided on driving around this abandoned mental hospital. It's just too cool and creepy. There's a cemetery where they mass buried many of the patients, just beyond the hospital and doctor houses. Past the cemetery, everything gets rural. You are far from town by this point, and there's only this single lane, lone, winding road. We're driving, having fun, just talking about anything and everything. It's late afternoon by this point, probably around 4.30. It's just like any old drive that we had been on so many times. That's when I looked in the rearview mirror and saw a, probably 90s, white Jeep Cherokee behind us. It had seemingly come out of nowhere. We both shrugged it off. We thought it must be one of the prison guards or something. It became unnerving when the longer we drove, he never turned off onto a side road. He just kept following us. I remember my aunt playing it so calm, but I knew she was fully freaking out. She kept asking, is he still following us? Is he still following us? There were times when I didn't see him, and I'd say, no, I don't see him. Then, in the next minute, there he was right behind us again. He got close enough at one point. I could see his face, relatively. He was wearing what looked like very big and bulky sunglasses. He was middle-aged, I assume, white with a hat, and his dashboard was covered with junk. We kept driving further on this road through the middle of nowhere. There were several times we'd lose him, and we would feel relieved. At one point, we came out to a railroad crossing on a hill. After we passed it, I didn't see him. We were so happy. And then there he was. He followed us for what felt like hours. If we sped it up, if we sped up, so did he. I still get chills at the memory at looking in the rearview mirror and seeing his face. We were also in such a rural area that we could not get a cell phone signal. Finally, we emerged onto a highway. We had no idea where we were, but just so elated to get to a main road. We turned onto it, and my aunt sped off. I remember we got back to my mom's house, and we were full of fear and adrenaline. We frantically said, we were, we were out driving, and this guy started following us. My aunt finally confessed how scared she was. We never told the police or anything, and my mom always thought we were making a big deal out of nothing. But it was truly terrifying to be out in the middle of nowhere, no cell phone signal, and a strange car following you for a long time. I remember we talked afterwards about it. Like, what if she had run out of gas? Her car broke down. What would we have really done? Hi, gang. This happened a few years ago in the Netherlands. At the time of writing, my girlfriend was coming over, and we felt like having a few drinks in the local cafe that evening. The particular thing about our favorite cafe, though, was that they didn't provide any electronic payment options. It was all cash and cash only. However, as luck would have it, there was an ATM very close to the main bus stop which was also close to a local supermarket. So, after my girlfriend's bus arrived, I told her I'd grab some cash from our shared bank account in order to pay for our drinks that evening. So far, so good. When we got to the ATM, there was an abandoned cart in front of it, which kind of looked odd to us. Also considering that the pavement had a bit of a slope. Anyway... 
My girlfriend figured she'd return the carts while I got the cash. Things were pretty normal until I suddenly feel my girlfriend push into me. When I look up, she's looking backwards. Excuse you, she sneers. Unlike you, I actually know this guy, and I'm allowed to stand this close to him. She also pats my shoulder and tells me that she's got this. So I focused on completing my transaction. I had a good hunch what might be going on there, but I also wasn't worried too much because I always keep my hand covered with my wallet or any papers I had start typing. The guy behind us makes a bit of a lame excuse about trying to figure out if this was the right ATM, which is pretty bullshit because it doesn't matter from what bank they are. When all of a sudden, some lady walks up to us while screaming. I saw all that. Why did you try to cut the line? My girlfriend tells her that she's not cutting the line, that I'm her boyfriend, and she's merely trying to get Mr. Shoop over there off my back. The woman doesn't want to listen and once again tells my girlfriend that she'd better scram because trying to cut in line is so damn rude. At this time, I had to put the money in my wallet. Grabbing the receipt and after I turn around, I tell the lady that my girlfriend wasn't cutting in line and that we'll be leaving now, to which my girlfriend adds that she might want to watch her back if she's going to use the ATM. There's a line which people should wait behind, and it's there for a reason, you know, my girlfriend says to her, but the woman doesn't want to hear any of it. She scoffs, making a snide comment about asshole line cutters and how people like her, my girlfriend, always tries to blame it on others, shit which we didn't respond to. Not going to waste my time over all this nonsense and bullshit. While we were walking to the end of the street, my girlfriend wonders what the heck that was all about. After which I shrug. Karens are being Karens, I guess. We get to the corner, look around, and lo and behold, the creepy guy is allowing Karen to go in front of her. What a surprise and she happily accepted the gesture as well. But something was not right there. Fast forward to a few years later, approximately two months or so, and I'm reading a local newspaper when I suddenly spot an article in the regional section which warns about pen fraud, explaining that people need to be more careful using the ATMs because scammers were known to try and look over people's shoulders in order to discover any pen codes. And what do you know? It featured a photo of the same lady who had been berating my girlfriend. Apparently, she had also fallen victim to these scammers, and the article described how she had no idea how any of that was happening. It was a complete surprise to her. <laughs> yeah, sure. If only someone could have warned her about all of it. Oh, wait, we did, and yet she wanted no part of it. Maybe next time. Hear people out before you start berating them. Don't get me wrong. I don't like it that she got scammed out of her money, but considering the way she behaved, unwilling to listen to any reason, I can't say that I'm all that surprised either. It happened last year. I was damn curious about what the actual deal was about this dark and deep web stuff. So I went on to YouTube for watching tutorials on how to access the dark web using Android. And I planned on surfing the dark web using my phone. I didn't know what I was up to, but I was way too curious and excited. So everything was set. I covered my phone camera with tape, 
went into my room and locked it. Opened the Wikipedia site for dark web links. Everything was cool. And I went to those normal happy chat sites. I didn't text. I just observed. So, you see, I gained some confidence and opened this one creepy anonymous confession site. I swear, you guys, my faith over humanity vanished away after reading some of the confessions on there. Some people commented how they killed their wife, mom, daughter, and neighbor. Some commented how they tried to kill someone and failed and how they reject it. Some commented how they love when they see people suffer and some graphic things were written over there, which I honestly don't want to write as I'm definitely getting blocked after writing them here. Some more mentally ill, creepy people were there commenting how stupid people are for loving someone else and for not doing bad stuff to them. So I had enough of all this, but still I wasn't done. I wanted to see how much I can. So yeah, I went and opened those pedophilic community chat links. It took a while to load the site. While I was loading, I thought maybe it was all fake and maybe the site is also fake. But then, boom. I saw this site full of texts from sick people. I can say they were ill or maybe they're not even human. I don't want to explain any of the things from there over on this platform. I may get blocked. The next thing I did was went to this site. I don't remember well what it was called or anything, but I do remember that it was selling things made out of human skin and some organs. Damn, were they costly. It made me almost puke out everything and anything inside my stomach. So I closed the site. I now went to those sites that sells drugs, guns, and other illegal stuffs. It was boring for me, so I decided to stop and close every freaking thing and delete all the browsing app and went to sleep listening to my favorite songs. I wasn't able to sleep for two days straight. Everything felt horrible and ugly. But after four to five days, things went back to normal. I was using WhatsApp, texting my friends, and then I get this notification. Ding, ding. Someone texted me on WhatsApp. It was an unknown number. It was an international number. I opened the text not thinking much, and I saw this creepy text word for word. Why are you ignoring me? I got a little tense as I don't have any friends abroad, and maybe it was a scam. I ignored it, and the next day I got another text from the same number saying, You can't ignore me. I'm still here. You can't run away. I was now damn sure that things got out of hand, and I almost believed that I was going to die. I quickly blocked the number and told my close friends what had happened and about the dark web. One of my friends said that the same thing also happened with him last year after when he surfed the deep and dark web. He said that he blocked the numbers but soon started getting creepy, deadly calls. So he changed his number and life was good again. So now, here I was, a messed up teenager. I was out of breath. I was afraid to tell my mother and father even. But I tried to control it by myself. The next day, I got another text on WhatsApp from another unknown international number saying, Why did you block me? You can't do anything now. Now I was shit clear that someone just fucking got my number through hacking. I quickly blocked that number and reported it and deleted WhatsApp deactivated all of my social media account. After a week, I came back and now everything was cool. But the next week, I got another damn text from an unknown international number, you guessed it, on WhatsApp itself. So, 
guess I was not afraid enough, and I decided to not open the chat and blocked it quickly, reporting spam. After that, nothing happened, and I promised and swore to God and myself that I am never, ever going back on there for doing that shit again. Even if someone offers me money to search the dark net, nah, I ain't going over there again. So this isn't too crazy, but it had me so scared at the time, I was crying. I was 16, going home from a friend's house. While I was getting on the train, this man was following me. He was maybe 45 to 50 years of age. He didn't speak English too well, but well enough that I could understand him. So I was getting on the bus, and like a lot of people, there's nothing to make him stand out yet. Well, I go to sit down, and he sits down right next to me, which was unsettling because there was other open seats, but I'm not new to creepy people in public places, so I just stayed there. I was myself, and it was about 6 p.m. at this time, in the winter, and I live in Midwestern, United States of America, and so it was already dark out. Then, this man starts talking to me, and I was in the corner seat, so I couldn't move unless he got out of his seat, or I just went over him. He starts off asking me where I'm going, where I say I'm going to meet some friends. I didn't want him to think I'm going home and then follow me. I thought it was strange for him to ask me where I was going, and I was already paranoid as hell. Then he asks for a hug, and I say no thank you. He then goes on to tell me he needs a hug because his wife just died and he's terribly upset. I started ignoring him at this point, and he goes on to say that his daughter also just died. He starts making shit up, and I'm ignoring him. After about 20 minutes, I get off the train and am super thankful to get away from the strange man. That's not the end, though. The man got off at the same stop. At the same point, I was waiting for a bus to come to bring me to my final destination, and the man gets off and follows me to the bus stop. Waiting for the bus with maybe two other people, and, of course, this man. He doesn't approach me, but as the bus pulls up, he comes up and puts his arm around me and tells the other people that, this is his girlfriend, referring to me. No one really said anything, and we got onto the bus. I started getting super nervous and grabbed my phone from my bag just in case I needed to call 911 or something if this man keeps following me. He again sits beside me, but I don't sit where I'm trapped in this time. He starts saying he can walk me to my friends so I get there safely, and I say no thank you. Then he says I am going to bring you to your friend's house, so that was verified that he was indeed going to follow me, which sucks because I wasn't actually meeting friends. I was going to my house. I start panicking and want to call my mom to pick me up from the bus stop instead of walking there, and... To my luck, my phone is dead. It's dark. I'm alone. My phone's dead, and some weird-ass dude is trying to follow me. He continues to talk to me about I don't even know what, and the bus was empty at this point besides just us and the bus driver and one other guy, and bless this other guy's soul. I kept looking at the other guy very intensely, and the panic really started to set up and I was not answering any conversation of the weirdo at all anymore. The other guy comes up and tells the weird guy to leave me alone, or he is going to call the cops, and that I clearly don't want to talk. Weirdo gets very aggressive, and is telling him to fight him, and cussing him out, and all this other stuff. Then, the bus comes to a stop, and the other man physically removes the weirdo from the bus. It was a sight to behold. 
I was so happy. I thanked the man so much, and luckily, it ended good. It was still very uncomfortable, and seeing how aggressive the weirdo got, I don't doubt his intentions were not good. So yeah, weirdo from the bus and train. Let's not ever meet again. I need to explain two things before I tell this story. First, I have a sleep disorder, and I've had it my whole life. I sleepwalk. Nothing too dramatic, mostly just do everyday things while sleeping. Open the fridge, put clothes in the washer without starting it, take the vacuum out of the closet, and set it in the middle of the room and leave. That sort of stuff. When I was younger, this was an every night occurrence, but now I'm in my late 30s. This is a once or twice a year thing. Second, I am native. I have a healthy respect for the stories of spirits my ancestors told. Many hunting trips, I would sit around the fire with my dad, listening to him tell stories of the tricks Wendigos play to try to lure you into them. While I'm unsure if I believe the stories of skinwalkers and Wendigo, I don't tend to mess around, just in case. Shoot to roughly three weeks ago. My husband and I both work construction. We have hard, long, and rewarding days. Once dinner is over and planning for the next day is complete, the dogs have to be taken out for the last time. Our heads hit the pillows and it's lights out until the alarm sounds. We sleep like the dead. Pretty sure war could break out in our bedroom, thundering tanks and all, and we would sleep right through it, wondering in the morning where the hell all the holes in the walls came from. <laughs> I'm sorry, this has happened to me before when I used to take Ambien. I would do the craziest things and then wonder, like, what happened? <laughs> Back to the story. Our bedroom is fairly good size and has a small bay window in the corner. My husband likes to sleep with fresh air, so he takes the window side of the bed. This particular night, though, something woke me up. I never wake up. The dogs were quiet. Typical northwest weather. Rain quietly tapping away. No thunder, no heavy winds. I looked the dark and quiet room over, and nothing was out of place. The only noises besides the rain was my husband's box fan gently humming away. I was confused, but decided to adjust my blankets, flip my pillow, and go back to sleep. As I closed my eyes and took a deep breath to relax, I heard my husband, Babe, babe, come out here and give me a hand with the boys. Confused and still foggy from being woken up from a deep sleep a few seconds earlier, I opened my eyes to the pitch black of the room again. Rarely one of three dogs will need to go out at night, and if one goes, they will at will go. We live in an incredibly rural area, and it's easy for them to just get lost in the dark woods. Not a good thing when you have bears, coyotes, cougars, and whatever else on your property. Babe, babe, can you come out here and help me with the boys? He called again, voice right against the half-open window, not concerned, just very demanding. Annoyed and groggy, I leaned up, popping myself up on a stiff pile of blankets to look at the window. It was too dark to see him. The floodlight is on the other side of the house. Babe, come outside, my husband demanded. It was the third beckon that bothered me. He was never that pushy. If something was wrong, one of the dogs wandered off. He would say that. It's happened before where he would say something like, Come watch these two real quick. I can't find Murph or something like that. Something wasn't right. I was regaining my focus and shaking off the sleepies, quite awake at this point. I knew it was him, 
My husband has a very distinct voice. He's a Sicilian from Queens and has a very deep, unintentionally loud voice. It was at that moment, staring back out the window, I realized I wasn't leaning on a pile of blankets. The pile of blankets was breathing. I was leaning on my sleeping husband, listening to him call me from outside of the window. Babe, come outside. The voice came again from the window. I put my hand down on my husband's face. He was there, asleep next to me. But his voice, or what I thought was him, was at the window. I laid down next to him, very, very close to him, and closed my eyes very tight. In moments like these, I'm the type to just try and pretend it's not happening. I didn't hear it again and spent the next half of the night trying to fight off the spookies and had, at some point, finally fell asleep. I told my actual husband about it the next morning, after his, oh my god, you look like death, comment. I hadn't slept well. He laughed it off as I had probably had a creepy sleepwalking thing. Thing is, when I have a sleepwalking event, I remember nothing. I don't recall dreaming, walking, or anything from those nights, no matter how hard I try. It's almost like a blackout. I am sure I was awake for this one, though. Every time I think of it these past few weeks, I remember those hunting trips, poking coals around in the fire with a stick, while my dad tells his serious yet animated tales of Wendigo tricks to get you to come to them. I know it sounds crazy, but I think there's a Wendigo living in my woods. So this happened a long time ago, but I've never forgotten it as it was one of the strangest encounters in my family have ever had. One time, as a child, I went with my family to the grocery store. It was our monthly trip to stock up on groceries, so we were going to be there a while. I was about 12 at the time, so by the age, I had a good understanding of how to read people. We started in the produce aisle, and suddenly a strange man caught my eye. He was standing awkwardly close to us, sort of fake browsing the vegetables. His body language just seemed off. He was standing with his back to us, but something seemed strange about the way he was positioned. As he slowly moved down the aisle, we would slowly rotate so his back was always facing us. As we got a little closer, I could tell he was wearing those see-behind glasses, those gimmick sunglasses that have hidden mirrors on the side of the lenses so you can see behind yourself. He had a dirty gray zip-up jacket on and long, dark, messy hair. He had to be at least in his 40s. Our shopping went on, and whenever we went, I would see him standing there, staring at us from across the store. He would keep his distance from us, but he was always within eyesight, no matter where we were in the store. About 30 minutes in, my mom still had not noticed it, but he was starting to really creep me out. My mom didn't believe me at first. Eventually, we got to the refrigerator aisles, and this is when it got weird. Whatever aisle we were in, he would quickly pace past us occasionally. At this point, he wasn't even trying to look like he was even shopping. My mom and sister were starting to notice this and also seem concerned. At one point, we were grabbing something off the shelves and I could see him just standing on the opposite aisle, peeking through the shelves at us. His sunglasses were still on and now his hood was up. We started to walk faster and do some random zigzags around the store to see if he really was following us and to try and, you know, lose him. But he would keep up. 
all in a very sneaky way at that. He would always be at the opposite end of the aisle, but he kept up with us the entire time. By this point, my mom was concerned, so we pushed the car up to customer service area to talk to a manager about it. By this point, we had lost him. We informed the manager, and she was very helpful. She actually went to go find the guy and talk to him. We waited at the counter until she paced back to tell us with a confused look on her face. She walked up to my mother and told us, He said, You're his mom? By this point, my mom and sister were concerned. The manager rang us up and said we should leave and then they will escort the weird man out. We walked out to our car, staying close to our mother, when we were met with a horrible sight. The man just standing across the parking lot, across from our car, with his head slightly tilted and a big grin spread across his face. We floored it out of there, but we could still see him just standing there, watching us leave. Whoever in the hell that guy was, I seriously hope we don't bump into him again. This happened about a year ago during the summer. Something you should keep in mind is that the house I have lived in had one acre of land surrounding the house. Where I had lived was near a farmland. I had woken up at around 8 in the morning on my living room couch, having fell asleep the previous night as well as my mother and sister, who were sleeping right beside me. I had planned to watch this movie I hadn't finished the previous night on my laptop, as well as eat breakfast in the dining room of my house. I had sat down at the end of the dining room table, which was the closest chair to the kitchen. Keep in mind, if I leaned back in my chair, I could see onto the farther side of the kitchen, where the door that led to the deck was, which had this huge window right next to the door. So, I turn on my movie and start to eat my breakfast as my dog trotted over to me and sitting next to me. I believe I was about 45 minutes into the movie when my dog had switched her spot now sitting right under the archway that led to the kitchen, staring at God knows what. I felt her move, but I really didn't think anything of it. If it was serious, she would have been barking like hell. About 10 to 20 minutes go by, and I glance over at my dog, noticing she's still staring at something. This time, I heard shuffling and scratching over in the kitchen. I called out her name, but she wouldn't just move. So when I had walked over, I followed her trail of vision and noticed that she was staring at the window in the kitchen that leads to the deck of the house. I nearly shit myself when I saw something or somebody behind the window outside. Peeping through the blinds, I forgot to mention there was a chair on the deck right under the specific window. So whatever the hell that was had to have been balancing on that chair to look inside. It looked bald almost, if that makes sense, and white with pinkish tone. It had been holding on to the window frame, peering at my dog and I, while scratching the screen on the window with his horribly heavy breathing. I remember thinking in the moment it was a person trying to break in because whatever it was wanted to get in desperately. The thing was sort of small though and it seemed as if it didn't want me to see the rest of its face, only its eyes. This whole time my dog had been watching whatever that thing was and not barking. I'm saying this because something as simple as Dropping a cup will send my dog into a huge fit, barking like crazy. Even a voice coming from the TV would cause a great couple of minutes of barking from her. Now, as I said, I believed someone was trying to get in, so I ran over to the couch in the living room 
shaking my mother awake and bringing her to the kitchen. And of course, whatever in the hell that was had simply disappeared. I would have thought I was losing my mind if my dog Hatton had been seeing the same thing as me. I peered out another window, checking the driveway in case it was a person, and that they drove a car here. But there was nothing of the sort. My mother went out into the deck and looked around, but there was nothing there, except fingerprints on the window frame. We checked around the whole yard, and nothing was found except for the prints. I'm quite traumatized to this day, knowing that whatever that had been was watching me for quite a while, and I didn't know about it. And also the fact that if it was a person, it would take a while to get off of that land. Even if they tried running away, we could have caught them because of the huge yard. I'm not living in that house where this had happened anymore, thank God. I have other crazy experiences from that house, but those stories are for another day. Before I begin this next story, I would just like to say, Tina Mead, this story is for you. Here you go. How to be perfect. Number one, lock the doors of the room you are in. Make sure nobody else is inside. Two, get a mirror, a piece of paper, a marker, a candle, a knife, and a mallet or something blunt and heavy. Number three, Light the candle. Number four, draw what you envision to be perfection on the page with the marker. You don't need to even be good at art for this to happen. Do not fuck this up unless you want to be deformed, as once you get the candle lit and begin to draw, this is your one chance. 4A, be 100% truthful for this step. Draw what you think perfection is if you break this rule. Refer to 10. 5. Chant to the candle the phrase, golden light, golden me. Say it three times in a row. If you break this rule, refer to 10. Number 6. Take a breather and burn the paper with the perfect view on it. Once you do this, there is no turning back. You have fully committed to this ritual. If you break this rule by backing out after this, refer to 10. Number seven, pick up the mirror and look into it. Vent to it. Tell it everything you hate about yourself. Your bad traits, looks, flaws, anything you think isn't perfection. Tell it to the mirror. Number eight, the mirror should show your reflection nodding and looking sorrowful. Everything you confess something, that imperfection should disappear in the mirror's version of you. Number nine, if everything is done correctly, your reflection will begin to move the way you do. If so, you have done it right. If after about three minutes of talking to it, it doesn't start to move the way you do, refer to 10. Number 10. If a rule says refer to 10, you fucked something up. Shatter the mirror and blow out the candle. Do not fucking unlock the door. I swear to God, don't fucking do it. Even if you hear your family or friends, don't open the door. 10A. Don't turn on your phone. It'll work like a mirror and let it in. If there's a rotary phone in the room, grab that and use it to call the number 111-111-1004. It'll make things a lot easier. 10B. If you see yourself in the corner of your vision, toss whatever you have near you at it. They'll shatter like glass. 10C. They'll leave at midnight. Doesn't matter when you started. It'll always be a midnight unless... You call the number in rule 10A. Then it'll end whenever he shows up. 10D. 
if you don't follow 10 through 10C and get caught by your perfect, I'm sorry. I hope you don't mind being a reflection. Since this happened several years ago, I might get some parts mixed up or some events I may have forgotten, so I'll try to retell my experience as best as I can. I also apologize for not being a good writer. It's probably going to be all jumbled and confusing, but please bear with me. Here's a bit of a backstory. When I was a little kid, me and my mom would visit my grandparents and we would all go to church together when we would visit from out of town. I had a friend at the church who I would be super excited to visit every time I went. We would talk a lot about Pokemon and just stuff we liked in general. Around that time, I had started puberty. He seemed to be attracted to me. He would hug me and ruffle my back. He was a big guy always wore the same yellow shirt. It seemed innocent for a while, and we sort of had a relationship for a few months. Everything was good up until we were dating. I was probably around 16, and he was several years older than me. He one day confided in me that he could see angels and was given a sword from Jesus to fight demons. Yes, he really did say that to me. He said that he could see angels and that Jesus Christ himself gave him a sword, which he stores in his body, to fight demons. And as stupid as I was, I believed him. I don't know why, but I just did. The times where I wasn't visiting, we would talk over a stream where we played TF2 most of the time. He would tell me these stories of fighting demons and would talk me through his angel, and he got so much weirder. He would tell me how I would be his princess in heaven and that we would rule together. That's around the same time I started getting very uncomfortable and weirded out whenever he would hug or try to go further with me. At one point, over an incident, I can go on over that later. I tried to cut ties with him and break up. He would not have it, not one bit. He would continuously send me emails begging for me to come back and how I was making a bad choice leaving him. The last time I ever came into contact with him was also the last time I went to that church. Me and my mom and little brother all had to go to the church for a small get-together for my grandma's birthday party. Knowing the ex's family caters church events, I knew in my gut he was probably going to be there. My mom told me not to worry about it when I knew that something was going to happen. When we arrived, I told my mom that I was going into a room where the little kids were playing at, where I knew I would be safe while we waited for cake. I luckily brought my DS to distract myself and sat down to play. All of a sudden, I felt like someone was looming over me. A big presence. I knew it was him. I instantly went into fight mode and ran and hid around the church until he stopped following and looking for me. My mom and my brother instantly took me back to the house after I came out of hiding and I never went back to that church. I hope to never, ever go back to it again. P.S. When we visit my grandparents now, I stay back at the house while everyone else goes to church. My mom occasionally goes to church with them and sometimes encounters him. He tells my mom weird, cryptic shit sometimes. Sometimes I just want to go just to go back just to tell him to never talk to my family ever again.
This incident happened at my dad's house a couple of years ago, somewhat relevant to the story. My parents are still married, but live apart because of their work situations. They often see each other on the weekends. My dad lives in a town of about 25,000 people, and it's pretty blue collar for the most part. His house is in the downtown area, which has been re-gentrified. So it's not a bad area to live in, but it's also just a stone's throw away from the worst parts of town. My dad's house is also directly across the street from the main entrance to a university. So there is a university security checkpoint just a few steps away from his front door that is manned by real police officers 24-7. My dad's house is older and has a detached garage in the back. His backyard is surrounded by a brick wall with two wrought iron gates, neither of which had a lock on them. Since everyone usually enters through the back door, it's just really inconvenient to have a padlock on the back gates where you constantly having to lock and unlock it come rain or shine. The garage door can only be open using a key code. Inside the back gate on the side of the garage is a small crawl through space that was covered with a board at the time. We have no idea why this weird little space was put there unless it once held an AC unit for the previous owner's workshop in the garage. One weekend, my mom arrived to visit and was looking through the garage for some of her things she had stored there. She was particularly looking for a large floral duffel bag where she stored her sewing machine. Her sewing machine was still in the garage, but the floral duffel was nowhere to be found. She asked my dad where it was, assuming that he had used it as a suitcase since he does travel overnight, occasionally for work. He told her that he hadn't touched it, and it should still be in the garage where she had left it. They both shrugged it off, assuming that one of them had just misplaced it and forgotten where it was. Flash forward a couple of weeks later. My mom is back to visit my dad, and I am also there with my daughter. My dad walks out of the back door one morning and notices that the board on the little crawl space was damaged as if it had been kicked in. He decided to go into the garage to investigate. Soon after, he called my mom and I into the garage to see what he had found. There was a piece of rolled up newspaper that was charred black on one end. Someone had opened the back gate at night, kicked in the board over the crawl-through space, and lit a piece of newspaper on fire to use as a torch as they glanced around the garage for, presumably, anything of value. And the freaky part is, they did this all within a hundred meters of a police security checkpoint while the four of us were sleeping inside the back door. And we were lucky that they didn't find the spare house key hung on a nail inside the garage. My dad put two and two together and realized that this was probably the burglar's second entrance into the garage. A couple of weeks before, when my mom's floral duffel bag disappeared, my dad had noticed that the board covering the crawl-through space seemed loose and had taken steps to tack it from the inside. He assumed that the burglar originally entered through that same space and stole the duffel bag, either planning to use it to store items that he would steal from our houses, I guess, or it was upon his returning to my dad's garage a couple weeks later to gather items of value. Perhaps he was spooked the first time or something and ran off. After the second incident, my dad had thicker boards nailed to the inside and outside of the crawl-through space. It was, it has remained untouched ever since. But to this day, my mom always thinks twice before opening that garage door when it's dark outside. And my dad keeps a baseball bat right next to the back door. 
We're just glad that the guy's makeshift newspaper torch didn't provide him with enough light to find the spare house key and enter while we were all asleep in our beds that same evening. And that, your listeners, brings a close to these true scary stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Mrs. Interscare, Sugared Spite, Samantha Place, Colt Stonewolf, Stephanie McLaren, Tammy Slayton, Amy Klemko, Chrissy Elias, Tina Mead, Cindy, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Luz Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Again, I can't thank each of you enough for supporting this channel for without you there would not be a me or this channel and with that again you have my deepest gratitude if you are sleeping i hope slumberland is treating you comfortably if you're awake i hope you've enjoyed this collection until next time please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there i'll be reading to you soon have yourself a good morning a good afternoon or a good evening peace love and light to you all